All right, we left off yesterday with a very nice poem from uh, Joseph Plunkett. And today we are moving on still in the fourth initiation, which is the crucifixion of Jesus and uh, how it relates to the gospel story and also how it relates to um, humanity as a whole. And deeper and even deeper than that, right? All right. The wonder of Christ's mission lay in the fact that though he was one of a long continuity of perfected divine men, he had a unique function. He summed up in himself and brought to a conclusion the symbolic presentation of God's eternal sacrifice upon the fixed cross of the heavens to which the stars bear testimony and which the history of religion has so successfully veiled and today refuses to recognize. Do we say anything? I guess we we'll just keep going there. <laughs> the heavenly man is today pendant in the heavens as he has been since the creation of the solar system. And as Christ said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And that was said in John 12. And not, not all men only, but eventually all forms of life and all kingdoms will render up their life, not as an imposed sacrifice, but as a willing offering to the final glory of God. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And that's from uh, Matthew 10, is a fact which is often forgotten and one which has a definite bearing upon the story of the crucifixion and its wider implications. It is, however, through the achievement of the last of the manifesting kingdoms, the human, that the cross and its purpose is completed, and to this the death of Christ bears testimony. Now there's a you know, as always, there's a lot going on in there. And, uh, you know, even the Bible talks about other heavenly men prior to uh, the word being made flesh or Christ coming. Um, you know, immediately you have Melchizedek that sticks out, the Ancient of Days. Uh, we can't forget these things who didn't have, uh, you know, he didn't have parents. I don't remember that uh, that line right now off the top of my head, but uh, he had neither beginning nor end or, or father or mother or so, something to that effect. Um, so that's something to uh, consider there. And then also that he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Now, what does that mean? And, and this is the personal aspect of this to where um, it affects us directly. And how can we get there? And, you know, what are the requirements or, you know, how much letting go do we have to do? How humble do we have to be? And, and these are the, you know, the questions that the ageless wisdom answers. And why I am a, you know, I, a proponent of it. Uh, and exactly how to do it, essentially, uh, step by step, as, as laid out in the gospel. But the important point is not his death, though that was climatic in the evolutionary process, but the subsequent resurrection, symbolizing as it did the formation and the precipitation upon earth of a new kingdom in which men and all forms would be free from death. A kingdom of which the man released from the cross should be the symbol. We thus complete the entire cycle from the man in space with arms outspread in the form of a cross through the sequence of crucified saviors telling us again and again what God had done for the universe until we arrived at the culminating son of God who carried the symbolism down onto the physical plane in all its stages and in time and space okay. in matter. 
He then rose from the dead to tell us that the long task of evolution had at last reached its final phase if we so choose and if we are ready to do as he did, pay the price and passing through the gates of death, attain to a joyful resurrection uh, and attain to a joyful resurrection. And uh, that should bring us, that brings a smile, you know, essentially uh, at whatever point that that comes to know that that is, you know, that is what's waiting for us someday um, is amazing. Uh, and, and it should bring joy. You could just sit on that for a while and really, really ponder what that, what that, even though we don't know what that will be like until we eventually get there, because things are not, things do not happen in any way as we think that they do. These things are set and they have not yet entered into the minds of men. So as these expansions of consciousness come, they never come as they are expected or as we anticipate or when we anticipate, but it is still good to contemplate uh, the mind of Christ always, right? And, and really, uh, as much as we can uh, uh, keep that in mind, honestly. But St. Paul sought to bring this truth home to us, though his words have been so often distorted through translation and theological misinterpretation. I long to know Christ and the power which is in his resurrection and to share in his suffering and die even as he did. He died in the hope that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I, I do not say that I have already gained this knowledge or already reached this perfection but I press on. And that is the proper attitude. Uh, you know, we can't, you can't say that you've attained to that until you have. Um, it's, it doesn't benefit anybody else, uh, generally speaking, even if you had. So there's no reason um, to claim, especially once we get this much further on the past to claim something that we're not and to pretend that we're something that we're not. Uh, that, that, that doesn't make any sense for, uh, for um, it doesn't help in any way. It would not appear from this passage that St. Paul regarded it as sufficient to salvation that one should simply believe that Christ died for one's sins. Yeah, so what about it? You know, if we're studying the gospel and if we're, we're we can't leave these things out, we cannot skip over these details that are so important. Um, he says, I I had not attained, but I want to attain, and uh, you know, I, I, I wish to share in the suffering and die, even as he did. And uh, knowing that that's, you know, essentially what has to be done. So he, it would seem that he recognized the uh, the significance for sure, and he would have, right? I mean, no, no doubt. Let me state here briefly and succinctly what it would appear really transpired when Christ died upon the cross. He rendered up the form aspect and identified himself as man with the life aspect of deity. He thereby liberated us from the form side of life, of religion, and of matter, and demonstrated to us the possibility of being in the world and yet not of it. And that's from John 17. Living as souls released from the trammels and limitations of the flesh while yet walking on earth. To the very deeps of its being, humanity is tired of death. 
Its only rest lies in the belief that the ultimate victory is over death and that someday death will be abolished. This we shall go into more definitely in our next chapter, but in passing, it may be said that the race is so imbued with the thought of death that it has been the line of least resistance for theology to emphasize the death of Christ and to omit to lay the major emphasis upon the renewal of life to which that death was the prelude. And I, and I, I think that's very easily uh, still able to be seen. This practice will end because the world today demands a living Christ rather than a dead savior. It demands an ideal so universal in its implications, so inclusive of time and space and life, that the constant explanations and the endless attempts to make theology conform to the requirements of the deeply sensed vital truth will no longer be needed. And I, I also feel that that is certainly, I mean, in, in my own being, I feel that that is certainly the case. Um, we are tired of death. We're, you know, we're collected to the collective consciousness. We can, we can sense these things. Um, we are tired of death and, and we can, we're reading this because we're tired. We were tired of death. That's what got us to this point. Um, you know, what's on the, you know, where does it go yet that we don't necessarily uh, know until we can know, but you can drop death and, and, and put it out of the mind that capability we do have, um, and you can embrace eternity, um, prior, I want to say, you, you, we can do that. And know beforehand that you 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 know we this is coming and this is real and we don't have to worry. There's no need to worry any longer. There's just life, and then eventually life more abundantly. Whenever we uh, get to that point, it makes things much more pleasant, and it it makes many things look silly, and it, it reality begins to set in. Uh, that this is a long journey and there's really nowhere to go. This is it. And there's a lot of comfort in that though. Uh, once, once we can allow that and, and include that in our beingness, you know, it doesn't, the journey isn't over at that point. And the journeys, uh, apparently the wonders never cease, even, you know, beyond uh, this book and beyond uh, many other levels of consciousness that, you know, Christ is working towards even now. Uh, so that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, where do we, where did I leave off here? Let's see. This practice will end because the world today demands a living Christ rather than a dead savior. It demands an ideal. Okay, I already got through that. The world has outlived the thought of a wrathful God who demands a blood sacrifice. Most of the world, right? And we have outlived that. And if we embrace that, that would be involutionary. Intelligent people today must agree that modern thought does not clash with primitive Christian ideas. But in regard to the propitiation for these evil inclinations, the case is different. We can no longer accept the appalling theological doctrine that for some mystic reason a propitiatory sacrifice was necessary. It outrages either our conception of God as almighty or else our conception of him as all loving. And that's from the paganism in our Christianity by Arthur Wagle again. Humanity will accept the thought of a God who so loved the world that he sent his son to give us the final expression of the cosmic sacrifice and to say to us, as he did upon the cross, it is finished. As was said in John uh, 21, 19, sorry. We can now enter into the joy of the Lord. 
from Matthew 25. Men are learning to love, and they will and do repudiate a theology that makes God a force of hardness and cruelty in the world, unparalleled by men. The whole trend of human life tends to repudiate those ancient tenets which were founded in fear and instead courageously faces the facts and the responsibilities, <clears throat> excuse me, which are inherent in its spiritual birthright. When the church lays its emphasis upon the living Christ, and when it recognizes that its forms and ceremonies, its festivals and rituals are inherited from a very ancient past, we shall have the emergence of a new religion which will be as much divorced from form and the past as the kingdom of God is divorced from matter and the body nature. Uh, I, you know, for us who are reading this material, I, I think we, you know, we, we very much look forward to the uh, new world religion and we do see the need for it and uh, the reappearance of, of the Christ and for change, whatever, at whatever cost necessary at this point. Right. Um, knowing that uh, it's necessary to get, you know, change is necessary to get to this point so that people are, you know, woken up to their spiritual nature um, and to what has been hidden. Orthodox religion as a whole can be regarded as a cross upon which we have crucified Christ. It has served its purpose and the custodian of the ages and the preserver of ancient forms, but it must enter into new life and pass through the resurrection if it is to meet the need of the deeply spiritual humanity of today. And I think that's all, you know, we can just see this very, I don't, I'm not saying we see this fourth initiation plainly, but we see all these things that are being said very plainly. There are very spiritual people out there, but they're hanging on to um, old philosophies and older re religious tenets, but nevertheless are still very spiritual people and are faithful to that right? um, and are willing to hang on to it. Um, for a lack of better uh, understanding uh, brought to them by the people that they, we trust to, to speak these things, right? So this is, this is great stuff. Nations like individuals, we are told, are made not only by what they acquire, but by what they resign. And this is true also of religion at this time. All right, that's, that was from a, a, a book called The Supreme Spiritual Ideal by Sir Radhakrishnan in the Hibbert Journal from 1936. Its form must be sacrificed upon the cross of Christ in order that it may be resurrected into true and vital life for the meeting of the people's need. Let a living Christ be its theme and not a dying savior. That, that'll be a big shift. Christ has died. About that, let there be no mistake. The Christ of history passed through the gates of death for us. The cosmic Christ is still dying upon the cross of matter. There he hangs fixed until the last weary pilgrim shall find his way home. From the Secret Doctrine, Volume 1. Oh. No, that's uh, cosmogenesis. I believe. The planetary Christ, the planetary Christ, the life of the four kingdoms of nature, has been crucified on the four arms of the planetary cross down the ages. But the end of this period of crucifixion is close upon us. Mankind can descend from the cross as Christ did and enter into the kingdom of God, a living spirit. 
the sons of God are ready to be manifested today as never before. The Spirit himself, capital H, bears witness with our own spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs too, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share Christ's sufferings in order to share also his glory. All creation is yearning, longing, and to see the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to futility, not of its own choice, but by the will of him who subjected it, who so subjected it. Yet with the hope that at last the creation itself would be set free from the thraldom of decay and enjoy the liberty that comes with the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole of creation is moaning in the pangs of childbirth until this hour. And more than that, we ourselves, though we possess the spirit as the foretaste of bliss, yet we ourselves moan as we wait for full sonship and the redemption of our bodies. And that's from Romans 13 from the Weymouth's translation. Uh, we've all read that, I'm, I'm certain, um, in, in other translations. It's interesting that the Weymouth translation is used so often. Um, it's probably a, an indicator uh, that the way things are said are rather appropriate. Um, you know, because when I, I was, I used to read the King James Version and uh, because, you know, I figured it was, you know, as far back as a version as I could basically understand or learn to understand. Uh, but, but being that this is used that, uh, you know, that's, that's interesting. Towards this glorification of God, we are all moving. Some of the sons of men have already achieved through the realization of their divinity. It is of interest to note how the two great branches of Orthodox Christianity, the Eastern as expressed through the Greek church and the Western as expressed through the Roman Catholic and the Protestant churches have preserved two great concepts which the spirit of the race needed on its great evolutionary journey away from God and back to God. The Greek church has always emphasized the risen Christ. The West has emphasized the crucified savior. Eastern Christianity looks to the resurrection as its pivotal teaching. I'm not exactly sure uh, myself what Eastern Christianity might mean. I, uh, but we do know, I mean, I think of India and, and you know, some of the I don't know, out that way, but the West has emphasized the crucified Savior, and that that is certainly, certainly true and easy to see. There's some overlap there for sure. That Eastern Christianity thing is uh, an interesting remark to me anyway. Uh, the need of a death unto things material, the tendency of man to sin and to forget God, and the necessity for a change of heart or of intention have been the contribution of Western Christianity to the religious beliefs in the world. But we have been so preoccupied with the subject of sin that we have forgotten our divinity, and we have been so intensely individual in our consciousness that we have depicted a Savior who gave his life for us as individuals believing that had he never died, we would never have enter heaven. On these truths, the Eastern Christian has placed little emphasis, stressing the living Christ and the divine nature of man. Assuredly, only when the best of the two lines of presented truths are brought together and then reinterpreted, shall we arrive at the basic concept upon which we can take our stand without questioning, and also with the certainty that it is inclusive enough 
to be really divine. Sin exists and there is sacrifice involved in the process of adjusting our sinful natures. There is a death unto life and a need to die daily, Corinthians 15, as St. Paul puts it, in order that we may live. Christ died to all that had its existence in form, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. But we in the West have forgotten the transfiguration and lost touch with divinity, and we should now stand ready to accept from the Eastern Christian what he has so long believed. And that, that is certainly uh, would seem to be the case. The Gnosis has always been in the world. Long before Christ came, the divinity of man was affirmed and divine incarnations were recognized. Of course they were. How could, you know, uh, we can't put the happenings of today and assume the way things are today and the way our emotional states are and desire nature and the way our minds are. We can't appropriate that, if that's the right word, to the way things were 2,000, 3,000, Plus, years ago, we can't just, we can't make assumptions. You know, and, I, and I'll go back to it, but, you know, it's mentioned up here only, you know, assuredly, only when the best of the two lines of presented truths are brought together and then reinterpreted, shall we arrive at the basic concept upon which we can take our stand without questioning and also with the certainty that it is inclusive enough to be really divine. Now, again, uh, you know, you want to say the theosophists and the ageless wisdom, or the and the wisdom, you know, the wisdom of the ages, they got this right. Um, at some point, I think we're going to talk about Master DK and Alice Bailey some more. But the ageless wisdom sets the framework for what the future world religion would look like if we could just see it. The science is there. The psychology is there. The HPB, you know, I, all right, well, let me step back and go the other way with it. HPB. Uh, you know, Blavatsky, she brought cosmogenesis, which explains the big giant picture of this event that from a, the out, you know, the very far zoomed out macrocosmic standpoint, essentially. And then also gets into the anthropogenesis of it and the evolution of man and the earth. And, and it zooms in a little bit. And then the blue books, which I call the blue books, the Alice Bailey books, the DK books, um, given through by Master DK, they bring it into the individual. So now we, we really do have the entire picture. We do have the synthesis of um, science, religion, and philosophy, essentially. It's, it's here now. Uh, it's only in our own ignorance that we are not uh, going, uh, migrating towards it and then expressing it at this point, because it's here. The fact that others don't see it is irrelevant, essentially. Um, now, will it, and under, uh, you know, we try to tell people that a zoomed out perspective of the Bible is important in order to see this. And that's obviously the case. You have to have the big picture and, you know, as well as the, in, you know, the smaller and more individual events. But this, what we're talking about is even, this is way beyond the gospel story. This is the whole picture. And the, uh, the condition of 
of humanity and uh, the condition of humans, the human condition, and seeing ourselves. And if we can see ourselves, then we can begin to understand the greater. And you, you know, it's a process, you know, induction, deduction, and but not just that, invocation and evocation is going to be the science of the new religion eventually as it's mentioned in the books. Um, it's a, a invocating a res, in, an invocative response brings the evocative response from higher and synthesizes uh, knowledge uh, in, so that it can be understood by the, by the, by the brain. And uh, this is where all this goes. It's already out there, but it will take the condensing into layman's terms by those who understand the big picture and can make it uh, make it understandable, more a little more easily understandable. Like a break, I want to say, like almost like a break-in period, like a bridging period, um, as this eventually begins to take root and, and grow more and more. So anyway, I didn't mean to go off on that there, but uh, I just want to say that the material is there. It is there and um, it's for us. The Gnostics themselves claim to be the custodians of a revelation which was not uniquely theirs. So again, now we have custodians being a key word there, those who believe they have the revelation. And when these things, I'm just, you know, this is interesting. Uh, you know, I mean, let's talk about this for just a second. Just like a song is made, you know, you've heard a song being made and there's almost at the same time, there's another song being made and they sound very similar. Or when, when one invention is made, another invention very similar is produced by another human being nearly at the same time. When um, a new mathematical understanding uh, comes into the system, it's often recognized by more than one individual. And that is so that it can take root and spread. So there's no one custodian of anything. Uh, it's really universal truths to be shared uh, by all. It's not meant to be hoarded. It's not meant to be patented and used for uh, financial, you know, selfish financial gain. It's, it's for humanity for various reasons, for our welfare, for safety, for, you know, growth. I mean, so many things. Um, for our evolution. So there isn't a custodian, you know, there, or there can only be a claimed custodian, but which had always been presented in the world. Uh, they claimed it was uniquely theirs, but which had always been present in the world. Uh, it's so now we're even going deeper. These are things that have been understood for very long periods, but then somebody um, accesses, you know, makes contact with that knowledge and then claims it as theirs. An authority, you know, you become, they want to claim authority on these matters. And GRS Mead, um, an authority on these matters remarks that the claim of these Gnostics was practically that the good news of Christ, the Christos, was the con consummation of the inner doctrine of the mystery institutions of all the nations, the end of them all being the revelation of the mystery of man in Christ, the mystery of man was unveiled. And there are many, um, secret type of schools that you know don't are very careful about how they present knowledge 
and, and how it's discussed and talked about. But many of them are out, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not on across any lines. I'm just saying they're, they're, many of them are uh, at a date and we can, we are now capable of learning these things through this process of invocation, evocation much faster than they're being given out. And much of what is held is now exoteric knowledge, meaning it can be given to the masses. So, um, yes, we have to find this information and we have to find, you know, uh, we have to be kind of led to it. But these books that Alice Bailey put down for us are, uh, they contain everything we need to know to this point. And there will be further teachings um, given soon. So it behooves us to um, get caught up to speed with what's available now because there will be additions. Um, and it's said that they're coming quickly uh, and within, you know, after 2025. And, that, if, and that's from DK. I, um, there are cycles to this. They are deep. Um, they can be seen and recognized once the material, some of the material begins to synthesize. And, uh, do I know anything? No, I don't know anything. I, I know nothing. <laughs> All right, I'm going to leave it there for today. Uh, there is a lot going on. There's a lot for me going on there, and I, I'm going to ponder on you know some of these um, some of these things as well. But um, we will pick up in this part right here again tomorrow, and have a good day.